when I trade options and a, a move like that, I'm always thinking I'm going to risk 50% or zero, basically. And it's just, it depends if, if you get that little spike back and then it kind of rolls over. But but it doesn't. It just it, it's another fifty dollar a fifty dollar candle on a one minute on the one minute chart. And I guess it's, I guess people don't want to talk about that strategy because it's liquidity limited. I kind of take like a rolling two week P and L, and I'll divide it by ten, and I'll just double it, and that's what I'll make my lockout basically for, for the next week. Before getting the video, just a quick reminder that this is not financial advice and I'll also link all the tools I personally use to trade down in the description. So don't forget to check that out. Sit back, relax and enjoy the show. SMCI, the opportunity of the year for certain people and for other people, it just wasn't that much of a big play or people didn't participate in. So I wanted to talk about first if you thought it was really the opportunity of the year on the short side or if you thought it was more an average to an average plus opportunity or if there was way to make more money on that name than what people talked about uh, over Twitter, I guess. Yeah, um, you know, we've seen these trades, especially in large cap, large cap names, they, they happen infrequently. Um, but when they do happen, there is massive range and a, a massive velocity of selling that comes into the name. Um, I think that anyone, anyone who's a trader should think or look at this and, and see that this, there was an opportunity. Um, was there an opportunity for every trader? You know, it, it all depends on where you're at in your journey. Um, I think that that's why, you know, Twitter to a certain extent is kind of flawed or very flawed. Uh, too many people are going to get caught up in seeing the people post big numbers or talk about how many, how much they should have made or how much they, how much their puts were worth if they just held them, um, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't catch it. I was, you know, I missed, I completely whiffed. Um, and, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you just have to live and you move on. Um, it's, it's just one of those names that, you know, no matter what, like, it'll happen again, right? Um, a couple of people on Twitter and in my own review talked about how there was a similar trade in Tesla and mRNA. And those are the two that I was kind of um, remembering when I was thinking about this trade as well. Um, but they all, they all happen differently, right? They all, they all happen differently. So, you know, it's, it's like they say, the stock market, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to play out the exact same way, but it's going to rhyme. Um, it's going to look similar or, or behave similar, similar early. Um, and I think that's what happened. Um, and for everyone who thinks that they missed their year making p &L, you know, th that's okay. And certain prop people, you know, are, are disappointed. And I'm sure certain prop head traders are harping at all of their traders for missing it. Um, and you know, that it, that's a part of the game. Um, you know, when you're a prop trader, you, a lot, a, lo a lot of guys really want to focus on those, what they deem is asymmetric risk reward opportunities where they can try to risk as much as possible to make as much as possible in that, that short window versus having time on your side, like a swing trader, for example, who, you know, may have ridden that up three, four, 500 points, you know, over the course of two weeks, you know, that prop trader is trying to make that same amount with some more size in, in that one day, basically. I would like to think that trader that trade for firms, so prop traders would risk or would be willing to risk more just because it's not their money from experience. Like, it's like a, a deal, like I'm risking everything I can. And if it doesn't work out, so be it, not my money versus somebody that's trading in own, his own portfolio slash his own money would be a bit more risk averse. Would you think that would be the case? Yes and no. Um, just, just because it, in the end, it still comes down to personality based. Um, I know that I have, you know, I have friends at, at, in that prop world that they're never going to go all in just because they don't want to be in a position where they're 
if if that shot or that you know that shot that they that you're talking about if it doesn't work out they don't have to work back out of a big p l hole right and it's it's so just because it's someone else's money you know and if you're lucky and if you're good enough you can go to another firm right you, there are a couple of firms that you can go to but a lot of prop traders are comfortable where they're at like i don't know many prop traders that have really really quote unquote you know been around the block right where they've tried every single prop trading firm and if, if you have that that mean you're either not that good or you're you've blown up a lot right so so there's you know there's something to be said for that um, most people i know stay in one or maybe two places just because you know why would you want to leave why you know you don't you shouldn't have to have to leave um if everything's going well and and you like everything that the firm has to offer you in terms of retail um i think that that's where i you know from my experience at least on twitter and, and some of the retail traders that i know they're either going to be extremely risk, risk averse right just because it's their own money and they're very stringent and follow their process um trading a certain percentage of their portfolio every every trade is calculated to half a percent of your equity or your account is so small that you're kind of just yoloing right where it's like all right i built into twenty five thousand dollars i'm going to take five shots of five thousand dollars each and hope that i can get the 10x on one of them and you know it maybe and that was potentially an opportunity for you, for you to do that considering that trade if we talk about smci um trading the equity was a bit i guess more um tough when it comes to buying power and just you know managing risk with spread uh if it starts to shift on you it could skip a few points like really easily and i thought oh i th we thought that trading the option was just a better option on that name and was this was there anything different than usually on the option side because when when you talk to me about the option price they seem like so cheap for some reason considering the the potential reward of that trade and i do trade option here and there but i never traded this type of play with option so i wasn't sure if maybe that play with the option was better than others because we talked about uh, Tesla and Mara, uh, or mRNA actually. So, and these, I wasn't looking at the option chain or I don't think I can get back the option, cha option chain or even the, the option chart just to kind of review that name. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's just one of those things where it, it, always, it always looks so easy in hindsight, right? The options were really expensive. Um, you know, even though the move happened on a Friday, uh, just because the average true range had worked itself up to, I mean, now now it's my my 14 day average true range is $85. It says, but I mean, before Friday it was $55 or so, right? So at $1,000, you're looking at maybe a hundred hundred dollar move, right? You know, other straddle, right? So 1,100 to 900 ish, but it, when you look at those types of moves you always have to think bigger, right? The day that it comes off, it's not gonna come off one ATR or two ATRs. I was telling myself, I kept telling myself that no matter what, if and when it does come off and if I'm gonna try to catch this move, it's gonna make a three, four or five ATR move. The second part of my thinking was that it's gonna make a measured move. I'm I'm, I'm big into measured, measured moves. And you know, looking at a bigger time frame, it made that really big measured move. Um, and we can talk about that in a little bit if you want, but, and, and that's where you could have really cap capitalized on um, like lower priced options for this week, right? If you were, if you were looking or willing to take risk over the weekend, you know, on the short side, you know, because it closed at the absolute lows. You can use you know, obviously getting more leverage, but you can contain your risk. Like when I trade options and a move like that, I'm always thinking I'm going to risk 50% or zero basically, and it's just, it depends on how much time duration that I have left in the in the trade, how much I'm paying for the options, how aggressive do I really want to get, how much do I really love the setup, do I think that this is the exact moment in time 
you know, because that's the thing with options. You kind, you're kind of threading the needle to, you know, to make those big moves. I remember looking at, and I don't, I don't, I don't think I can get a chart up, but um, like the nine, it, you know, when the stock was at 1150, you know, I was looking at the at the 900, the 900s, and they were at two bucks, right? You know, so that's that's a way that someone could have really, you know, crushed it, I guess, right? You know, when you go from two to 97, and you know, it's not like you're using so much buying power, right? You could theoretically just buy a hundred of those at two dollars, right? You know, right? I'm risking two thousand dollars on this trade, right? But if you're trying to trade stock, you know, risking two dollars, even if you're short from a thousand on like that whole red dog reversal thesis where you're taking out that prior high of day, um, the high of the day was eleven hundred. So you're trying to risk two grand, you're shorting, you know, two hundred shares. No, no, you're shorting 20 shares, right? You're shorting 20 shares, 20 shares. And even if you if you trade it perfectly, you're making 300, 300 points, right? So, which is what, six grand? Yeah, it's not much. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So you're, you know, it's just not, sometimes trading the, uh, the stock is just not, you, you're not going to see the same risk to reward. So in terms of that asymmetric risk to reward, right, you can really capitalize on on via options that's something i i didn't really bother looking first i i was just so i don't know if i was out of it and if it's or if it's something i should have really looked at or my focus on trading is just not in these type of setups so it was kind of okay to miss it because if a breaking news would have came at the same time that this was happening i would have took the breaking news and i would have been happy taking that trade and if I was like, you know, in that trade and I would have missed the breaking news, I would have been mad that I missed the breaking news. So, so yeah, it was a big missed opportunity. I think there was probably more money to be made on that name, but maybe it just wasn't my priority in terms of focus and it was fine to just miss it because of that reason. Hindsight, it always hurts when you see like a big drop like this and like, you know, the tweets of people that made a lot of money, but I think you kind of just have to move on and and accept that you know I, I mean, like you know that's why I said I mean for some people it was probably an A plus 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 setup right but realistically you get this gap you know and I'm looking at one minute charts and, and one minute is not my preference um, I don't really don't like looking at one minute minutes I you know for me to really help myself I prefer looking at you know five fifteens thirties and hourlies um, you know for both day and swing trading. You know, but I will look at the one minute if there's an earnings play or something I'm looking to focus on. But you know, just just think about the most most of these Twitter traders. Almost every single person when they're posting charts is posting one minute charts, um, right? You know, it's gapping up and still strong, and, and you know, and it's sideways. But even when it even when it's right here, right at 10:50, when it before it really started coming off, it's kind of holding view up. There's no increase of volume there's no there's no reversal candle there's nothing tell you telling you that this is definitely the top right and this is where it's just a little bit different it's it's there's nothing telling you here that I, you know i just don't see a play where anyone should tell you that this was definitely a plus i mean the daily setup in the extension yes i i i'm totally agree, agreement with that but you know, just looking at the volume, there's nothing here. Maybe this is the first candle, all right, that shows you, okay, increasing volume, a, a nice big $20 candle lower. Okay, are you just going to hit 1019 now? And then if you hit 1019, how are you sizing this and where are you risking? Are you risking to 1077? You risk, uh... So you're risking 50, you're risking 50 bucks, right? Because how are you going to risk anything less than this at this moment, right? In, in, at this moment in time, right? And, and then if you, if you're, if you don't do that, and then you see the next candle, it goes all the way down to a thousand, basically, and bounces. And then, so basically, you have three candles where it's now down fifty dollars. And I, I still don't know, you know. And you have increasing volume, and now you can start thinking, all right, maybe this is it, right? And so maybe, maybe you're thinking, I'm going to put some offers up at ten twenty, ten twenty five, ten fifty. If if you get that little spike back, and then it kind of rolls over. But but it doesn't. It just it, it's another fifty dollar a fifty dollar candle on a one minute on the one minute chart. I, I just don't see how, you know. I was watching it in here for a little bit, and I just is this really it? Was there is this was this definitely the tell with with you know not super high volume, right? I, you know, 
So I don't think people should beat themselves up on missing this, right? Because then what? You know, and I'm a proponent of, of, of waiting so you can at least gauge your risk, right? Because as I mentioned here, are, you know, what do you, if, you're, if you're risking five grand, all right, I'm shorting 100 shares, okay? Risking the high of the day. How, you can't even find a spot to increase your risk, right? Because it just, you know, I, and it, which is great because now you're 10 grand in the money, you know, but, you know, and I, I, I like, I like flags, right? So maybe, maybe I'm looking in here, but so $25 flag after it's come off 150 bucks, you know, is that, is that really optimal? It, you know, if for me, it was just a really, really hard trade. Right. And, and I don't think anyone should beat themselves up for missing the, missing this move. Um, you know, and then you get a really nice little, little look, you know, get a consolidation, you get this little, 870 flush down to, you know down five bucks and, and you get that little, little reclaim where you can risk eight, 865 and you know you get a really nice move if, if counter trend yeah. scalping is your yeah. thing that's the right? one I, I that's a trade i took actually on this one yep yeah 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 you said this was this is the area and that's like that's a good trade right you see this 870 it it, it breaks and as soon as the bids come back into 870s you know, you try to buy some 870, 871, 72, knowing that now you're now risking at 865. Um, and, you know, looking for some kind of move back into the moving averages or, or view up, yep. right? Um, you know, and then it just ranges, right? It ranges. And, you know, all these one minute guys just like, oh, it's just ranging up and down. Maybe it's going to go to VWAP and it never comes close to VWAP. Um, and for me, you know, in the afternoon, I love trading 15 minute charts. Um, just, it just cleans things up so nicely. And, and this was the trade I was kind of upset that I missed, but you know, I had prior obligations. I wasn't around Friday of a long weekend. Um, and this is what I mean by the whole measured move thing, right? Um, you know, 10, 1070, 1080, let's call it 1080 to 860, almost a $200 move. So now you're thinking, you know, on a 15 minute chart, $200 move, maybe I can get, an, you know, 677. Is that, is that realistic? You know, I think that's realistic. You know, looking at 677 because I knew that the 20 day was around 680. So, but, but realistically, let's, let's think you always want to measure the base, right? So 864 to 920. Let's measure, let's fix 60 bucks ish. So I'm thinking maybe I can get it, maybe I can get it. Um, just because all these all these big moves, they like to gravitate towards whole numbers. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe this could break. I'm risking twenty five dollars to make seventy five dollars, and that's a good three R trade, basically. You know, when you're looking at the setup, and you know, and that's you know, that's what kind of what happened. And as I was talking about taking risk overnight, right? You get that next flush down to seven hundred, right? And you know, it doesn't quite make it to six seventy seven, but you know for for a day and a half move basically you, you get you get that nice 100 and 180 190 dollar move basically 200 dollar move call so it. without without having to even guess or fighting front side there was still a way to participate on that trade really when it was actually backside in a sense with like a, a small small yeah, risk totally. to 25 for sure the option i don't think they were as good because all the juice came out on the all the implied came off and then you had time decay so then you can take the Friday. I guess you could have still take the Friday one, but it was probably taking the following Friday uh, option, which would be this week, right? Well, so th that those seven hundred calls, right? So so this is where you know you can instead of using the zero DTS to really get some leverage, but you have to you know you're dealing with like decay. This is where I would this is where I was looking for. I would look for say that the, those those following weeks and the following weeks. I want to say 700s or 750s, right? If you're thinking measured move, I want to say around this time, if you know, if you go back in time, you know, they were maybe five or six bucks, okay. right? So yeah, they're really far out of the money, but this is where obviously options people, options traders or market makers are not pricing in that much, you know, that much, they're not implying that much, that much more volatility, right? So, you know, I, I'm not going to get into the whole Greeks thing because I'm not an expert on it. But to me, I would have thought that 
to that measured move, they, they would have been much higher, right? So you can still manage your risk by getting 800s or 750s or 700s, um, you know, cheaper, right? And if it closes on lows, right? If it closes on lows, and you're thinking that that gap down could happen, you know, this, you know, this is where it's all right. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll buy some 650s or 700s because they're they're still cheap because it's still 100 or 150 dollars away. There was a, a bunch of way to exploit that opportunity, and a bunch of way to make money if this was in your playbook, of course. Um, and that brings the net, the second subject, which was trading more size. Um, I don't think it should be something really related to an, necessarily an A plus opportunity, or maybe it should. Um, I wanted to have your take on it because it's been something that I tried so many times, so often, and it's it's just a little hard because it, every time you increase your risk, it starts with a big fat loss. That's just that's the name of the game. It just starts with a big loser. And then your first response to this is always to go size back down. But then it's like you're always kind of like, you know, grinding back up that loss. Example, if you took a, you increase your size, your normal loss would have been a thousand bucks. Now you increase your size a bit more and you had a bad day. So now you're stuck five grand on the day. Then you go back to your previous risk and then you grind it back up three days, four days later, you're back to flat. Now it's like, okay, let's size up again. And it works for a couple of days. Then there's a big opportunity that comes. You get smacked in the face because it doesn't work. And then you're a bit back down. And then your, your tendency or my tendency was always to size back down because that's what people say online or that's what I hear all the time, you know, size back down. And then, you know, you grind it back up and you're never really kind of just leaning in the, I'm going to trace that size and this is what it's going to be going forward. And I'm just not going back. So it's hard to implement really sizing up, except when there's something that's like so good in your playbook that you just feel like you have to. This is me. Like I'll just, there's some days or some type of opportunity that like everything lines up so much that the only thing you want to do is just add more, add more to your position. And then these are like your outlier winners. That's for me. Do you have a more systematic way to go about sizing up or maybe some issue that you had kind of in the past? Sorry for the quick interruption, but if you have questions that you'd like us to answer for the next show, don't forget to leave them down in the comments section. And I'll also link all the best tools for day trading in the description. So don't forget to check that out. Let's get back to it. Yeah, um, sizing up is tough. Uh, increasing risk is tough. I mean, everyone has, it, it's a, you know, it's very personality oriented, right? And, and risk, taking risk, <clears throat> taking risk is, taking risk on is, is definitely very, personal, right? Everyone's different. Everyone has different upbringings. Everyone has different backgrounds. Everyone has different lessons that they've learned or, or you know, everyone it comes has different monetary, you know, history with money, basically, you know, when it comes to like their family, for example, if, you know, I'm, I'm in the same boat every time, every time that I tried to risk a lot more, it, I, it always was a loss. It was just like, you know, it's the cost of doing mission, business, the tuition for trying to get big, right? And it always seemed to work out that way. Um, and the one thing I've learned is I've tried to, you know, redefine my risk and myself as a trader <clears throat> is you really have to break down your ego and you really have to start back at zero. Um, and it's, it's crazy as it sounds, you really have to get yourself to really trust your risk, yourself risking a hundred dollars and then $150 because even though going from, you know, I'm, a lot of it's going to be male ego, right? I'm sure in, you know, that that's, you know, just my, my own bias, but a hundred dollars risk to $150 risk is an increase of 50% of risk, right? And people don't think of it like that. People think of it, well, it's only fifty dollars more. It's only you know, it's only this. But then when you get to bigger numbers, it's ex exponentially bigger, right? Because you know, let's let's just use round numbers, for example, and and thousand dollars, right? A thousand dollars risk on a and a dollar, you know, a thousand shares, and all of a sudden you want to have two 
you know, two thousand dollars for risk, two thousand shares. Watching that stock, if it doesn't prove you right away, for example, right away, and you're you're taking a little bit of heat and you're down fifty cents, you're down that thousand dollars you're nor, you're used to risking, right? What do you think that most people are going to do? They're going to start thinking, well, am I wrong? You know, this is my thousand dollar kind of ouch point that I'm I'm used to risking, and this is what I would I would do this. I've done this so many times where I just start second guessing myself, start second guessing the trade. And, you know, you kind of just kick it out. It's like, all right, well, I was down a thousand bucks. That's what I'm used to risking. But then you don't, you know, and then what happens? It turned around. It just like, that was the little heat. That was the heat level that had you had to take basically. And if you kept your original stop, the stop, the stock and idea actually worked out exactly to what you thought. And the next day when that same setup happens, you're back to risking your normal size and you're only you're barely making back what you what you lost, right? You know, and that's the cycle. Yeah. That's the cycle. How do you break that cycle? <clears throat> and that's the million dollar question that everyone has to ask themselves, right? But the key there is that you too many people try to jump it. Like they try to go from a thousand to fifteen hundred to two thousand or one to two to four to five, seven to ten K, whatever it is, right? When in reality, you sh people should be making incremental steps to the risk where, all right, I'm going to risk $100 this week. You know, when I was trying to learn a new setup, you know, something like a new edge, you know, I, I was, you know, trying to risk $1,000 in the trade. And I, would j I just could not figure out for the life of me, you know, I just couldn't figure it out. And that, every day I'd see the pattern and the pattern. And the only way that I learned how to figure out how to do it and really trust the setup I had to go down to risking a hundred dollars a day, you know, on the every hundred dollars on the trade, you know, to force myself and to teach myself that I can do this. I can do this with a hundred uh, for a hundred dollars. I'm never, I'm not going to kick it out early. I'm not going to sell it early on the upside. I'm going to see this trade through risking a hundred dollars and just see what happens because a hundred dollars was my insignificant number. Right. And everyone's going to have an insignificant number and maybe $5 or $10 or $50. Right. It doesn't matter what it is, you know, no judgments here. Everyone has different starting points. And, and then you, and then you, and then you slowly increment it. All right. The next week I managed a hundred, hundred dollars to $120, $125, right. And that's still 25% increase. And, and, and if you're, you know, if you're risking 10 cents, you're going from a thousand shares to 1250, right. It's, it's, you know, if you, if you break it down smaller into smaller, smaller steps, I think that people will increase their risk a lot faster than they, than they think, but no one, everyone's impatient, right? Everyone wants that. Everyone knows or thinks. So now, especially after SMCI, I need to do it for the next one. The next one might be on Monday, right? But the next one might be on Tuesday and I need to be ready for it and size up for it, you know, but, but mentally and psychologically, you're, most people probably aren't right. If you're going to be trading, you're not trading for a year, right? You're, you're, you're trying to trade for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years, you know? So, you know, use that time to your advantage and, and don't waste it trying to keep yourself in this cycle of risking too much and just keep keeping, continuing to set yourself back basically, you know, where, where you're constantly starting over. Yeah, that was well said. Um, I've tried, well, Going back into like, you know, seeing that number that you just mentioned on your screen and then you kind of get this adrenaline rush to your brain and then your or stress or cortisol and then you, you can't seem to focus properly. I tried to hide my PNL to avoid um, having to see it, but it doesn't feel or it doesn't change anything really. I don't know if you're a big proponent of that. I need, I know... A lot of guys or most guys that I know don't look at their PNL for like, you'll check it out at, at a certain point to know where you're at on the day, just like, you know, by curiosity. But while you're in the trade, you don't really look at your PNL or you, the way I have it set up, it's been probably like three years like that. It's just I have position, share size, and symbol. And that's where I, that's what I look at. So I can like remove the actual price, but I haven't felt, or maybe it does make a difference. Um, 
I would have to go back and try to put it to really see if it makes a difference. But have you tried something like that? Or I, I you know, I, I hide my daily P and L. Um, just because my thought is, is that if I'm not, you know, on I, I set a lockout a lockout for every day. You know, a downside that I'm willing to risk every day. And you know, basically, as long as I don't see the alert on my screen saying that I'm locked out, you know, I know that. All right, I'm somewhere above that number, right? Um, because in the end, the only thing that we can control is risk, right? That's the only thing that we can control as traders: size and position, position size and risk, right? You know, that's in the in the end that that's our job. Our job is to manage risk. It's not nothing else. Once you get into a trade, you have no idea if it's going to work or how well it's going to work. And I think that a lot of people lose sight of that, right? Um, I had a big problem, something similar to what you're saying, right? What you're talking about to me is either those those realized gains or those unrealized gains where it's you see a number and it's like, then you start envisioning or, or thinking or believing that it's yours, right? That number, that's mine. That's my $1,000 or $500 or $100 or $10,000, right? And I need to, I need to bang out of it. I need to, I need to, I need to take it before the market takes it back for me. Um, you know, and then you have this, you know, cortisol brush or, and it happens on the downside too, because all of a sudden you're, you're down $2,000 or $3,000 or whatever the numbers are. And you've had that adrenaline rush. And it's like, I need to get it back. You know, I, I need to get it back or I can't believe the market took that from me or whatever it might be. And, you know, that's, you know, where a lot of trading traders, like they go down that slippery, slippery slope of, you know, a, a, like a death spiral, basically, you know, like you're stuck in quicksand and you're trying harder and harder to get out of it. And all, you know, all of a sudden you, you, you look at your PL at the end of the day and you're like, holy crap, how am I down 20 grand or how am I down, you know, five times my lockout because I just kept unlocking myself. Right. Or I kept looking at the number and just like, all right, well, $500 more, $500 more, you know, like just because it's that dopamine rush of like blackjack. And then, you know, and then it's all of a sudden it's gone, right? When when you should have known better to just get up and walk away because the better opportunities are going to come the next day. That's a good point because today was exactly like that. You know, I told you I got like, uh, I think I got five losers in a row. But before that, pre-market, I was up a bunch. Everything was going well. Then I think I took a couple of trades, bled like something like 50%. Then I went up a lot. And then uh, trades that were that I I think I was supposed to take, I took them. They were all news trade, and I thought they were gonna be news that move a stock, but I just punch in a stock, and then um, it didn't really move. So I took you know a smaller loss, or I took a loss. Then the next news came in, and there was like a big uh, rush of news flow. So I had to take these trades because if I'm a news trader, these are my playbook. And then I ended up with like a pretty I wouldn't say sizable, but like a, a decent loss day, which I think I think the lockout I have currently, it's not bad because it's below the threshold point that's gonna send me down a spiral. Is this like do you have like a number or if you probably experienced this in the past that when you pass this certain number, then it's like every, everything breaks loose. Like this is where you go on a death spiral. Every, every time you hit a button after that, it just, it's always a loss, right? And you just keep trying and trying and trying. Yeah. Everyone has their number. Everyone has their ouch point. Everyone has just the, when they're so focused on the screens and, and then all of a sudden you become so ingrained in, on the, every single tick and every single movement, every single print. And, and then you're just, you're, you're so quick to react to everything, right? You're this, you're at that point, you're the scared money, right? And scared money. And we all know that the scared money doesn't make money, right? Um, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah, totally. Everyone has their, every, it happens to everyone. I mean, like, if it doesn't happen to you, then please write a comment below and tell us what it is that you do, you know, or that <laughs> to help you combat that, right? Um, I, I think for me, like, like, you know, to kind of circle back a little bit on you, I think it's important to make sure that you're taking risk on relative to your performance. Right. So I have I, I have a self-imposed lockout, right? Something that but it's lower than what my firm lockout is. But what I do is 
I kind of take like a rolling two week P and L and I'll divide it by 10 and I'll just double it. And that's what I'll make my lockout basically for, for the next week. And then I'll just keep doing that at the end of every single week. And that helps you, it helps me increase my size and risk or maybe the frequency that I'm trading. Um, when things are good, when there's, when there's activity or when my style is in play and, and, and when my style is not in play, it really decreases. or if I'm not seeing the market, well, it really decreases my size and, and risk, you know, on purpose. Right. And, and it kind of, it's kind of like a mechanical way to, to keep you safe. I I've never done that in the past. Um, I think I never did that because when things weren't going well, I was like, well, my lockout is going to be so small. It won't make sense. But then, you know, it, ju it was just getting worse. But then when things are, are going well, you always want to risk more or you want to risk more or you want to trade more until you want to get that money because you're like, oh, finally, I'm getting some good paycheck. And then you sometimes it goes the opposite of like, I don't want to take that much risk because now I want to pay myself, right? I've worked hard. I deserve that money. I don't want to just go risk it all on the next trade. It's like a, it's like a, a cycle of like, I mean, these, these are all great points that you're making because these are all things that I struggled with, you know, for a long time, but trade trading, trading in the markets, like all the things you're talking about is, are related to your views or, or my views like on money and what money means to us essentially. Right. Like in reality, trading is just one constant flow of water right it's like one constant flow like no how do you know if the trade of the month or your a plus trade or like the smci if that smci happened on the last day of february does that mean you wouldn't have taken it because it was the end of the month and you're trying to pay yourself right and 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 do you think that it means if it was happened the first day of march would you have taken outsized risks because you were thinking well i have the whole month to make it back right like every day every day should be created equal. And that's why I prefer to kind of keep my risk per trade and risk per day the same, right? Like, you know, no matter how I'm doing it, whether it's via options or smaller size or, or whatever it is, just because you never know what day is going to be the, the big day. And, you know, you know, you never want to take a, you don't want to have that mental battle with yourself in the moment when that trade's happening. Well, is this the A plus trade that I need to be risking three X three R on, because I think that this is going to make my month or make my year, you know, and what if it doesn't work and it's the end of the month and then I just blew all my profits, right? That, that I think that those beliefs or those thoughts about risk and your P and L, you know, it, I don't, you don't want to keep yourself boxed into that, that thought where, you know, I'm, you know, all of a sudden you're dialing it back just because you had a good couple of weeks or a good month. You know, you want to try to keep it as consistent as possible, in my opinion. And you made a comment about something like that. Um, when I sent you a message when I was a ZY or ZJYL, when everybody got smoked uh, end of the end of December. Uh, and I was like, man, what a shitty way of like finishing the year. Cause they all like all these guys are going to start the year on like a massive drawdown or like, you know, you're always already counting how much you made to the year. You probably already talked to your buddies. Now this opportunity that you, you couldn't like, even if you tried to manage your risk, it was halted. Nothing you can do about that black swan event. And then I'm like, man, you know, all these people, like they just like ruined their year or something. And then you're going to have to start back again. And you mentioned that like, like it, it doesn't matter. Like the next day is the same as like, it, it never ends technically. It always continue. Like you said, your ongoing flow of water, which is like a better way of seeing it because everybody always, you know, you only review when it's the end of the month. You only check how much you made per month versus like saying that like this just never ends. It just same thing. Just continue the process, continue, continue versus, you know, then oh, I'm starting, I'm going to risk more next month. If you're technically, you're supposed to be risking more now just just started now don't have to wait till next month it's like it's like those people who are constantly saying well it's the new year i'm going to go to the gym right it, or like why are you waiting to, you know if, if you want to do something you can do it anytime you want you don't you don't you shouldn't have to wait until the new year to go to the gym right you shouldn't have to wait for a starting you know 
no one's no one's going to wait no one's going to wait for you so why are you waiting for time a certain moment in time to to do or set forth whatever you're trying to do i think it makes a right. lot of sense it's it's a good way of seeing or a different way of seeing it versus what i was already all, not already i was always trying to see things per week or per month versus just saying like this is it and and i think the most prevalent point that i was doing at in was really about uh, when I'm uh, when things are going well. I had a three month streak or like you know really good profits for three months. Now I don't want to risk too much because you know I might ruin it. Like you know it's you kind of go with, like I mentioned it's like it's a bad balance between you know when things are not going well well but you do also mistake when things are or sorry when things are not going well and you do the same mistake when things are actually going well. Like you know it's. Uh, I don't know, like it's not supposed to be like that. It's like the, um, how do you say it's like imposter syndromes, syndrome? It's like, oh, things are going too well. It's tough, right? I mean, when when you're a prop trader and you're you're obviously taught to think of it in terms of month, but if you're a retail trader, you know, I have I've interacted with more retail traders. It's, it's always interesting to see how everyone thinks differently, right? Prop traders, they just, I think it's just, that's the way the accounting works. It's the easiest way for them to do accounting, right? All right, the month's up. What's your PL? Subtract all your fees. In a couple of weeks, we'll pay you out, or a week or two, or whatever it is. But if you're a retail trader, I mean, it's really a business, right? Like no matter no matter no matter what where you're trading, whether it's at a prop firm or <clears throat> your own account, you know what are you what are you looking to do with the money, right? Are you looking to really just grow your wealth, um, or are you looking to really just trade for income? Right. And, and maybe, and, you know, I know people that do both, right. And just separate accounts. And I know people that they keep the minimum pattern day trader rule in their account. And because they're retail every single week, they pay themselves, they pay themselves like it's a, a nine to five job and they just pay themselves weekly, whatever they made. And if they have a down week, they're not allowed to pay themselves until, you know, they get back and recover it. Um, and for them, that helps them feel like, I'm being rewarded, right? I'm seeing something for the work that I put in for the week, right? Versus, because no matter how you break it down, like that black swan, any of those black swan events or those negative days, even like you're saying that, you know, three month stretch, it, it all works out to be the same. It's, it's still a loss. It's, like, it's either a loss of the first of the month, the last of the month, the last of the year, you know, even if it's the end of the year, yeah, their year's ruined and the, beginning of their next year might be ruined, but they were still paid out on everything, you know, prop traders were still paid out on everything they made, you know, for the first 11 months of the year. And if you're retail, I'm sure, you know, hopefully you took a distribution where you weren't just trading, a, you know, recklessly large account, right? Um, you know, so, and, you know, so there's different things you can do, right? And, and I, I've spoken to some retail traders or who, they know what their monthly their monthly nut is, right? They know how much they need to how much they need to take out every single month so they can cover all their family bills, and basically they just take it out of their account on on the first of every single month, and you know that's kind of like their their paycheck, and now and they think of it as well now I now I need to spend the month making it back and and, and seeing seeing how however much more I can make, right? So everyone's everyone's different, right? This is my point, and. and Everyone tries to look on Twitter and, and frame themselves and their, their trading to certain people. Um, you know, so just like how a lot of traders like trading the one minute chart and I prefer trading a 15 minute chart just so I can slow down and process things. You know, some people want to pay themselves a qu every quarter and some people want to pay themselves daily and that's okay, right? Like, every, you know, everyone has to do what works for themselves, you know, and, 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 and not worry about so much about what everyone else is doing. Yeah, I think it's a good way to close it. It's it's like as much as there's good on on Twitter, there's also like such a a strong influence of how we do things. Even if we would have never done something in a certain way, it's just you see it and you try to emulate it or add it to your trading, even if it doesn't necessarily feel like it's right or it's not so good a device for you specifically. So thanks for watching this episode. If you enjoy, like and subscribe. Also, if you have any question that you'd like us to answer on the next episode, leave them down below. 